members, the Congress of Bridget Kwame, and the Student Nonviolent Authority Committee. Of the five, three were activist organizations. The Student Nonviolent Authority Committee, the Congress of Bridget Kwame, and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. These were the three activist organizations that you had in the 1960s confronting the system. Listen to me carefully. Put the three together, and you don't have a membership of more than 2,000. Put the three together, and you don't have a membership of more than 2,000. I'll give you a big, big figure. The Student Nonviolent Authority Committee had no more than 300, and they had the largest number. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Dr. King's organization, was an organization of preachers. They had less. And the Congress of Racial Equality had very few, uh, while well, it was organized since 1944, had uh, even less workers than the Student Nonviolent Authority Committee. So when you speak about being organized, you must be precise. Revolution is a science. It's not based on emotion. You don't get unity because you feel good. You get unity because you belong to an organization. You don't get unity because you feel good. You get unity because you belong to an organization. Therefore, there were no organizations in the 60s. That's why it was so easy for the police to wreak havoc on them. And clearly, it was easy. You had a mass movement coming up. It was rising. You had a responsibility. Give it direction towards the revolutionary path or try to safeguard your organization. Obviously, you can't do that. You'll lose your organization, but at least give the mass organization revolutionary direction. Therefore, if you look at the 60s, you had no organizations. As a people, we have not been organized. The closest we've ever come to being organized is when that great advancer of humanity, the Honorable Marcus Garvey, came to organize us. And anyone who knows anything about the history knows this organization was what brought all of the intelligent forces of the white world together against the Honorable Marcus Garvey to crush this movement. That's right. That's right. We have to know our history, and the conscious student knows their history. We have to become an organized people, and the conscious student has the responsibility to help organize the people. We are coming to our conclusion. We said the conscious student must live in truth. You cannot live in truth unless you create an environment of truth. Let me give you an example. If I'm a brother who takes drugs, and I'm on drugs, and I live on drugs, and someday I get touched by the hand of the Honorable Elijah Mohammed through the Nation of Islam, and I stop taking drugs, when I stop taking drugs, I don't hang out with the people who I used to hang out with who still take drugs. When I stop taking drugs, I'm with the FOI. I'm with the Fruit of Islam. When you see me, I'm clean. I'm doing karate. I'm getting all that stuff out of my system. I hang with people now who don't take drugs. I cannot not take drugs and hang with people who take drugs all the time. You know, when you stop taking drugs, you hang with people who don't take drugs. The truth, conscience, can only grow in an environment of truth. Because if you're a conscious student, you cannot grow if you're among the unconscious. If you're a conscious student, you find yourself with the other conscious students, you organize yourself, and even in a few of you, this is where your consciousness grows. The conscious student cannot remain conscious outside of conscious activity, organized conscious activity. Therefore, any time you think you're a conscious student, and you do not belong to an organization, and you think you know more than the others, you are just more unconscious than they are. Because she who knows more must do more. And if you know more, and all you know more is to show others that you know more, and you don't do more, you know less than others. Consequently, when you know more, you must do more. We see it all the time, brother, sister on the campus. Oh, man, last night, you know, a Brother Kwame was there. It should have been packed with the only few of us, but we were there. It was bad. We got down. Oh, you should have been there. Oh, you should have been there. No, I ain't going to tell you what happened. You should have been there. <laughs> That's unconscious. The job of the conscious is to make the unconscious conscious. The job of the unconscious, the job of the conscious is to make the unconscious conscious. That's why the conscious student comes to organization. The conscious student understands it. Three or four students saying the same thing everywhere on the campus is more power than one separated from the other saying the same thing but without organization. Therefore, the conscious seek organization. We want five conscious students among you this evening. There's one other thing that we will tell you about the conscious. The conscious knows the struggle is forever, not for today, not when I'm a student. I leave it tomorrow. But conscious knows the struggle is forever. Even this is done in capitalist societies. You know, if you're in an army in the American capitalist system and you desert, you can be shot. Do you know if you're in the army in a socialist country and you desert, you should be shot? Desert is a shot. They must be shot. They are shot because they endanger the life of others. Look, you and I are in the army. We have to take a building. We 
say we're going to attack tomorrow morning at 4 o'clock in the morning. We have 50 people we've lined up. We need 50 to take this building. At 4 a.m. when we show up, there's only 45 of us. Five have deserted. Well, we 45 are going to get killed. We need 50 to take the building. Well, since we're going to get killed, before they kill us, let's kill the five and put us in trouble to get killed. So deserters get shot. Now, you must know something. Anytime you start struggling for your people, which is voluntarily, and you put down the struggle, you have deserted the struggle, and you should be shot. Now, the African Revolution, hear me well, is the only revolution in which traitors struck with impunity. That's how weak we are. I mean, you have, Lumu, you have Mobutu, who killed Lumumba, who said of Zaire, struck with impunity. You have brothers and sisters who will tell you, make television to view, I worked for the FBI against the Panthers in the 1960s and walked the streets with impunity. Now, the reason why that happens is because we're all organized. We are unorganized, that's what really happens. Therefore, once the conscious are not unorgan are unorganized, the unconscious reigns supreme. As a matter of fact, they even make publicity for young kids now to become snitches against us so they too can walk the streets after. So certainly if traitors shot with impunity, you know what happens to deserters. Deserters are even honored. I see people come to speak to the people. They say, what you come for? Well, in the 60s I was doing this. In the 60s I was doing that. In the 60s I was this. In the 60s I was that. What you doing today? Well, in the 60s I did this. And the 60s I did that. What you doing today? And the 60s I was this. What you doing today? Well, I got tired. Shoot him. He's a deserter. Shoot him. He's a deserter. Because he has a profound effect upon the young coming up. The young might think you're supposed to struggle for some time. The conscious knows that struggle is forever. You will always be making a contribution to your people, even when they're not oppressed. Do you not know that? Do you think you only make a contribution to your people when they're oppressed? On the contrary, it's when your people are not oppressed that you shall truly make a contribution to them. Because your energy shall be directed towards that, not to fighting the enemy to make you make that contribution. Therefore, you will always be making a contribution to your people. Therefore, struggle is eternal. We say the conscious student understands properly Harriet Tubman. She took struggle to the grave, and so will that conscious student. Now we come to organization. Our party, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, is a revolutionary party. We are a revolutionary party. Our objective is Pan-Africanism, the total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism. We are socialists. We know you're against it, but we're not worried about you. You don't know nothing about it. Matter of fact, American capitalism confuses you so much you don't even want to know. The other day I was talking about socialism, a man said to me, Brother well, Brown, are you still talking about socialism? I said, still talking about it. He said, yeah, you're a socialist? I said, of course I am. How come? Because I'm intelligent. What you think? He said, but Brother Bob, you didn't hear about it? Hear about what? It died. What? Socialism. Where? You didn't hear about it? I must have been sleeping. No! You didn't hear about what happened in Russia with Gorbachev? I said, oh, that, that's, that, that's just betrayal, Brother. Don't let it confuse you. No, no, no. Socialism is finished. I said, it can never be finished. He said, but all of them, all of them, they all gave, they all finished. They themselves, they moved. I said, you don't judge a system by its adherence. You judge it by its principles. Capitalism will confuse it. Yeah, he's judging socialism by socialists. I told him you don't judge socialism by socialists, you judge by its principles. He said, well, if you don't judge it by that, how are you going to judge it? I asked him, do you judge Christianity by Christians? <laughs> you want to form your thinking. You don't judge Christianity by Christians, you judge it by its principles. We don't even judge Christianity by the Pope. And certainly not by the preachers we got, because most of them are pimping for Cadillacs. <laughs> We judge it by its principles. When you judge socialism, you don't judge it by Gorbachev. You judge it by its principles. Anyone can betray. If a system falls because of betrayal, Christianity would have fallen with Judas. People get confused because at least Judas had dignity. He hung himself. <laughs> Gorbachev is still running around the world making speeches and picking up 30 pieces of silver when he finished this. Yes, betrayal doesn't mean anything. Some people even get confused about socialism. Brother told me, yeah, he's supposed to be heavy now. Well, you know, uh, tell the truth, you know, socialism is a white thing. From the problem with you is that you do not understand that the particular history of Europe is never the universal history of the world. Right. Now, Europe tries to make it appear as if everything that founded came out of Europe. It's your problem if you go for it. 
I mean, they even paid Jesus Christ's wife, peace be upon his name, and he never put his foot in Europe. So you see what they do? They try to make everything, so they make it appear as if they invented socialism. They can't invent socialism. It's a universal truth. Newton can't invent gravity. He can observe the laws of gravity. Karl Marx did not invent the relationship between capital and labor. He can observe them, that's all. And anybody can make the same observation. Of course, in no way do we mean to belittle Karl Marx. Not us, he's a great man. I'm 53 years old. I've been reading him since I'm 16. I shall die reading him, and I invite everyone to read him. But you know, you don't read nothing. American people, they're really made stupid. I remember once when I was a young man, I was riding on an airplane. I was reading Hitler's book, Mein Kampf. You know, I was on an airplane reading it. So this woman next to me, and she's come to all the what I'm done reading my book. And finally she said, that. Why are you reading my book? I said, it was Mein Kampf by uh, Hitler. So why are you reading the book? I said, well, I want to understand something about it. She said, well, I'm Jewish. I said, well, didn't you read it? <laughs> I would figure that she'd be the first to read it. That's what I think. The first law of war is to know the enemy. Matter of fact, and I think everybody in America should have read Mein Kampf, because everybody knows about Hitler, they don't know nothing about him, except what they want to talk about. And all it takes is one book to read, and college students don't even read them. And they're the first ones to tell you about it. Look at this, look at that, look at that. Never read a book by him. I say even Jews are told not to read the book by Hitler. Such stupidity. Such stupidity. I'm anti-Zionist. I'm anti-Zionist. I read books by Zionists. So I'm going to attack them. I know exactly where to go. I'm anti-capitalist. I read my capitalism. I know it inside out. I have to attack it. I have to destroy it. That's my job. You are students. You have a responsibility to organize your people. Our party is a revolutionary party. We're socialists. We're anti-capitalist, and Africa is our salvation. Here as well. Here as well. Africa is our salvation. Here as well. This land belongs to the indigenous people of this country, the American Indians. <laughs> it's bad now. Capitalism will confuse you with its immoral logic. I mean confuse you. They even have it legal. That means that if I steal something from you, and I keep it for a couple of years, and you don't find out about it, then it belongs to me. It's called statute of limitations. <laughs> Could you imagine that? This is my, this is my boo-boo here that I'm wearing. If you kill me tonight and you take this boo-boo, it will never belong to you. Never belong to you. This land will never belong to anybody other than the indigenous people of this country. This is extremely important for us as Africans. One of the greatest crimes that an African can commit is to be ungrateful. In African culture, one of the greatest crimes you can commit is to be ungrateful. When we came to this country as slaves, the only, underline the word only, the only, underline the word only, the only place we found sanctuary and refuge was among the American Indians. The only place. <laughs> They fought for us, we intermarried with them, we were mutually accepted by them. Even if you know nothing of your history, you must know about the Seminoles in Florida. Florida got swamps there, and Africans from all over Texas used to get there. And the Seminoles accepted us when we got there, as members of the Seminoles with total rights and complete equality. The slave masters in the South were upset about this, and I don't know how these slaves were doing it, but they would come from far away Texas. I don't know how they find their way, but they find those swamps of Florida. When you want freedom, nothing can get in your way. Andrew Jackson, you know, is an Indian killer. Just like all the Indian killers, starting with uh, George Washington. All of them were Indian killers. Andrew Jackson went to the Seminoles. He said to the Seminoles, I want the slaves. The Seminoles said, we do not understand this word. It's out of our conception. <laughs> Andrew Jackson said, you know me. I'm an Indian killer. I love to kill y'all. But I'm not coming to kill you all this time. Just give over those Africans. Just give up the Africans and I'm gone. You know what the Seminoles told him? We are one people, all the people here. We know you have the power to destroy our nation, but we have no choice but to fight. Here's the hammer, tomahawk. They threw it down. They went to war. Their nation got destroyed for us. People cannot be ungrateful. Today we must stand shoulder to shoulder with the American Indians as they struggle for their rights in this country. When we were down, they helped us. Now they are down, we must help them. This is only natural. They've 
know this land is their land, Africa is our land. I know you don't know about Africa, because even those of you who come to school just to get money, if you look at Africa, Africa is the richest continent on the face of the earth. I show you how American capitalism makes them stupid. <laughs> it makes them stupid. They think America is the richest country in the face of Africa is richer than America. Matter of fact, you can use America in the Sahara Desert of Africa alone. Because that's even those who want money, they, they want money, but their thinking is so deformed they don't even look to Africa to even make some money. Of course, I don't want you to come to Africa to make money. I'm just showing you how the capitalist system has your mind so distorted. If you want to make money, they still not have you looking to Africa. But white folk go to Africa every day from this country. You know, white counterparts, when they graduate from college, are all trying to get a piece of the action in Africa. And they have you not even looking at Africa. Your people have to be organized. Africa is our salvation. It is the richest country on the face, continent on the face of the earth. When properly organized, it will be the most powerful. Able to protect your people wherever they are and make a scrape, this a quick contribution towards world peace. We want you to join our party. We said we want the most five conscious. But now, one last thing I forgot to tell you about consciousness now. To be conscious, you must love your people. To be conscious, you must love your people. And to love your people in this country is not easy. To love your people in this country is not easy, but to be conscious, you must love your people. And of course, as we always tell you, when you love someone, it's not by mouth, it's by action. When you love somebody, it's not by mouth, it's by action. And when you love somebody and they're in a lot of trouble, the only action you can make is to help get them out of trouble. So our people are in a lot of trouble. If you love them, you must be making daily, underline the word daily, underline the word daily actions to save your people in a systematic manner. You have responsibility to help your people. Now let me tell you something about your people now. With or without your help, they're going to be victorious. Let me tell you something about your people. With or without your help, they're going to be victorious. You can be like a catalyst. You can come to speed up the process to reduce the sufferings of your people. But even if because of you, you don't help speed up the process, they take the long way with a lot of bloodshed, they're going to get there. So the only decision you have is, are you going to help your people speed up the process with less casualties to arrive at their objectives? That's the only question you have to ask yourself. Your people shed blood for nothing in this country. So they will shed blood for revolution. Of that, you can be sure. You have a responsibility to help. For those of you who truly love your people, those of you who truly understand that we have a responsibility to organize our people, we invite you to come and join our table in the back. Our brothers and sisters there will take your name, come back and give you an orientation about our party. Those of you who do not come tonight to join our party, you have to join an organization working for your people. You have to join an organization working for your people. Now, I'm going to sit down. Before I sit down, I want an ego trip on y'all for a while. Yeah. An ego trip for you. You know, listen, I'm a bad brother. I mean, I'm a show, I'm a bad brother. Now. I've been fighting since I've been 16 consciously. Now I'm 53, and I've been hitting some heavy blows. I mean, left and right. I've been taking some heavy blows, you understand? But I've been giving some heavy blows. But you know, as bad as I am, I have never in all of my conscious life been outside of an organization. I'm a bad brother. I'm a bad brother. When I was a student of the Court Committee, they were getting ready to expel me. Before they expelled me, I was honorary prime minister of the Black Panther Party. When I was in the Black Panther Party and saw the contradictions rising and knew that I had to resign, before I resigned, I was a member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. I have never in my life been outside of an organization, and I'm a bad brother. Matter of fact, all the bad brothers and sisters, I know all of them, all of them belong to organizations. Asante Shaku is one of the baddest sisters that came out of the 60s. One of the baddest sisters. She belongs to the Black Liberation Army. Still belongs to an organization. Angela Davis is a rough sister. Rough as you can get, she belongs to organization. Rosa Parks sat down and made us get up. That's how rough she is. 
She belongs to the organization. Martin Luther King was a righteous preacher who everyone thought was by himself. He belonged to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Nelson Mandela is a name that is a household name throughout the world. He belongs to the African National Congress. His wife, Winnie Mandela, who's now divorced, they've had a trouble, they struggle. She belongs to the African National Congress. Malcolm X was dynamite. When Malcolm X left the Nation of Islam, he created two organizations, the Muslim Mosque Incorporated and the Organization of African American Unity. I do not know any brother, any sister, who's done anything for the people, who's a bad brother, that didn't belong to organization. Y'all got to be some bad brothers and sisters that y'all don't belong to no organization at all. Y'all got to be really bad because all the bad brothers and sisters I know belong to organization. Fidel Castro is rough. He belongs to the Cuban Communist Party. Kim Il Sung is rough as you can get. He belongs to the Workers Korea, Korean Workers Party. Mao Zedong shook the world. He belonged to the Chinese Communist Party. You can show me no great man, no great woman who's advanced humanity without belonging to organization. You can show me no man, no woman who's advanced the struggle without belonging to organization. Your people must be organized. We invite you to join ours, if not ours, any. But if you truly want to make a square, advancement to your people's struggle at this time where it must be qualified we must take this quantity and critically organize it into organizations so that we can rapidly advance your people's advancement your people's rapid advancement is in your hands you can either help them rapidly advance or do nothing and let them take the slow agonizing path to victory the decision is in your hands thank you ready for revolution <laughs> I'm going to bring Kwame Ture back up to address questions that the audience may have. Any questions? Hi, uh, no, fine, thank you. I appreciate it. Just a few questions. Can you speak louder so they can hear you? I have three questions. I'm sorry, um, I can't hear. We can all sing together, but uh, not talk together. I'm sorry, I'm not aware of that. Um, you made a comment concerning this organization. If you, if you could just maybe talk to speak on that subject as far as just about to deal with this thing that you should have said in your personal relations, um, where your position is as far as what you should have said. Who's your position? Who's your position? For just a second, the second point I'm going to do. I didn't understand this because you're a revolution, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You said as far as revolution is concerned, but yeah, you didn't think. I have not seen that either, uh, as far as uh, Seed is concerned, as long as it's an organization fighting for the people, if he's no longer in any organization, not doing anything, he's deserted the struggle, there's no question here. The uh, law and personal, if he's not an organization working for the people, he's deserted the people, no question about it. But I haven't seen the, uh, I've not seen the other movie, and uh, one thing I must tell you about Huey Newton now, Huey Newton was killed by the police. Huey Newton was killed by the police. Right. Huey Newton was killed by the police. Right. And, uh, I don't think people should get confused about this. There's no question about this. The police controls drugs in our community and they control drug addicts. Next question. Could you explain the new world order and how it applies to Africans and how we as students and best uh, well, uh, the New World Order is nothing but the same old world order trying to uh, hold on to colonialism and exploitation. That's all it is. And uh, we have to fight it every step of the way. Uh, uh, the New World Order was proclaimed with the war in the Gulf. And uh, since then, they've been uh, parading everywhere for New World Order. And uh, America is not concerned with the interests of anyone except its own interest. And its own interest is nothing but profit. 
So uh, I think we're quite clear the New World Order means nothing but heightened profits, but uh, we have heightened consciousness, therefore there will be heightened struggle. Is, uh, is because the approach uh, which you gave is one that I think is incorrect. I think first we have to make political unity before we look to economic unity. Uh, I think that uh, people who have your persuasion make the error in thinking that uh, Africa is poor. It is Africans that is poor, not Africa. What makes Africans poor is that they do not control their political destiny nor their continent, Africa. Let me give an example, even here in the United States, I give an example. We are told all the time that we are poor. Now listen to me carefully and tell me if you think it's true. I assure you that when we are organized, consciously organized as a people, and each and every one of us gives nothing more than 10 cents a week to one economic part, there is no economic problem we'll not be able to solve in this country among ourselves. What do you think? Well, I agree with you on that. What I think is, or more, more specifically, is that if, if there's an individual who wants to uh, work outside of the capitalist system, is that, uh, is there an apparatus in place well, if you want to work outside the capitalist system, you have to work in a socialist country. And, uh, of course, Libya is a strong socialist country in Africa, and they're very proud to have Africans come and work there, no question about it. So, what is the last part? What would you take to take a job in America? Would you then say that any job is fit, or, or who said any job is fit, or there are certain jobs that are unfit, being that they're all tied to the capitalist they're all part of the capitalist system. We are forced. We are forced to sell our labor to capitalism, just like we were in, in wage slavery, just like we were forced on the chattel slavery to work on the plantation for nothing. What makes the difference isn't the work we do, but the conception of the worker. If a slave has the conception that they're born to be a slave, they should be a slave, and the master is their best friend, they will pick cotton at night. If a slave knows that they're not supposed to be a slave, then they will do everything to sabotage cotton production. They'll break their hole, they'll burn the plantation, they'll kill the master, they'll strike out for freedom. It's the same thing in the capitalist system. We're all forced, we're all forced to sell our labor to capitalism. And when we're selling it, either we think we're supposed to sell it, or we know we're not supposed to sell it, so while working, we make organization to overthrow it. Just like the slaves make organization to make a slave revolt on the plantation, even though they have to be there every day working. So it's a question of conception that you can see that whatever job you do, you do for your people. So like, uh, if you got a big job at IBM, you understand, making a whole lot of money, they're working eight hours a day, you should try to rip off all the materials at IBM. <laughs> but the people's organization, and you should do as less work as possible just to maintain your job. <laughs> Every day we have to be on the slave plantation, even though we're in slavery, we have to do it until we get strong enough to wage civil war. And send it. Every day we keep making advances, making advances to our people's organization until it's strong enough to smash capitalism. We certainly have to do with discussions with the indigenous people of the land, the American Indians, because it's their land. Uh, but
But uh, we certainly know that until Africa <coughs> is uh, unified and socialist and is a powerful force, that uh, no Africa anywhere in the world will be respected. So uh, our central energies must be placed to Africa. Of course, the question of returning to Africa is not automatic. Anyone will want to see at least where their home is. Uh, so I don't think that's a real, real big problem. The real big problem is directing our energies and understanding is our salvation. Once that's understood, then the strategy will follow. Focus. Well, you mentioned the Honorable Marcus Garvey. The Honorable Marcus Garvey never saw Africa. He never put his foot on it. But no one can deny that during his lifetime, no man, no woman worked for Africa like the Honorable Marcus Garvey. But of course, but being more important than being an organization. I kept saying now organization was the key. And this I know for a fact, so no matter how, how uh, conscious you are of measuring an organization, this conscious will have no effect upon the quality of life of national people. It'll just be quantitative, not qualitative. So the organization is the crucial aspect of it. And of course, once in your organization, you can see how your organization is making its contribution to Africa. Every organization is country just about has some relationship with Africa. The Nation of Islam has a, uh, a uh, post in uh, Accra, Ghana. Uh, the NAACP has a lot of contact with the African projects that they do, even the Urban League. So uh, once you're in an organization, of course, it has it. Uh, the uh, Republic of New Africa, of course, also has a direction. So the organization which you join, they will direct their energies towards Africa, and hopefully you'll be in harmony with your thoughts and your actions. from uh, Bureau of West Africa, and I'm uh, proud to be here tonight. Uh, I saw you uh, post up, and I was like, excited to come and see you. I saw you speaking like during the early 70s, and you went uh, for a show with uh, your former wife, some friends from there from Cuba. And uh, I'd like to say here in this moment that your family student deserves the highest salute as a strong black man that has made a long distance mover and shift in a real thing that I believe Why? Because he decided to leave America, leave what he wanted in America, go back into Africa and live amongst the African people. Understand that. Even when they did not understand it, he fought, he struggled for many years in his state of being. And that's why I respect him very much. Now, I have to be in America at this time, and Liberia is a very important country. The history of the black race, for men of our people, you don't understand. Liberia is supposed to be the first black independent country and serve as a key center of black liberation in Africa. And that was where my father was supposed to go and reset and start as a base to get all black people to go. And as you said, that mission was sabotaged in the Western and international region. Uh, I'm concerned with two things. I'm, I'm an organization called the Liberal Education Foundation. We are concerned with education and culture as a keystone for political unity. And what I want to share with our brothers and sisters here is how can education and culture be used as a to bring our people together as a national and political because our people here are not very clear of the facts. They 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 are not very clear of the facts. And when we, as individuals, come from that area of the country to think about our brothers, we have to be covered up as a national and political. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We cannot uh, do it without culture and education. Let me give you an example. In America today and for a decade now, they have been screaming about the breakup of the family. All right. When Africans came to this country, we had no family. Our family structure was purposely broken. We know mothers were sold from their children, etc. We know it. Now, as Africans, the only family life we saw 
in this country was the nuclear family. That was the structure that we saw. Immediately after slavery, without the slightest analysis, we automatically followed the same family structure which the master had, the nuclear family structure. The hair, we're acting out of our culture and certainly without even reflection to education, even to this day. There are more than one type of family structures. There's a nuclear family structure, there's the extended family structure. There's a patriarchal family structure, there's a matriarchal family structure. There's a monogamous family structure, there's a polygamous family structure. There are many types of family structures. But we did not examine any. We immediately imitated, like we always do without thinking, the family structure of the master who destroyed our family structure. Up until this time, you hear people talk all the time about our families are breaking up, our families breaking up. No analysis, no research, just cries, like if crying can solve a problem rather than work, research, and understanding of the problem. They will cry. If you look at the nuclear family, it came out of Europe. It came out of Europe at a particular time when they were going from feudalism to capitalism when they needed to keep the male worker tied to the machine and they gave them the responsibility of the family and all the sentiment, you family, you can't leave your family. But today, people follow jobs, not their family. So it's clear the family structure is not necessary for capitalism today. And therefore, since it's not necessary, it's clear they're going to break it down. Well, if it's being broken down for the master, what for the slaves who imitated the system, the family structure is falling. Therefore, outside of their culture, they do not look to extended family, not only do they look at the family, following the master, they even become single parents. Single parents, as if a single person can raise a child. In Africa, we say, it takes a village to raise a child. <laughs> Therefore, here, without the slightest education and out of their culture, they make terrible mistakes. So it is only within our culture, and it's only through education, that we will advance. We must use education to look back at our culture, see what was proposed by our ancestors, look at it, shift it, keep the values, and bring it up to date. Until this is done, problems will not be solved. I only gave you one example, of course, there are many, 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 many others. Uh, one I laugh at all the time is in relation to brothers and sisters, you know. In our party, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, we have the All African Women's Revolutionary Union. Every sister in our party must be a member of the All African Women's Revolutionary Union. Now, we know that uh, men oppress women. And African men oppress their women. But the one place we cannot oppress our women is on the front lines fighting for us. If you look at our history, our women are out front everywhere, more than many other women in other areas on the battlefield. <laughs> Therefore, in our party, of course, as a revolutionary party, we know that organization is the weapon of the oppressed. Organization is the weapon of the oppressed. And since we know that organization is the weapon of the oppressed, we've organized our sisters. We have disorganized brothers. Since organization is the weapon of the oppressed, since men oppress women, you must disorganize men and organize women. In our party, there will never be an all African men's revolutionary union, only the all African women's revolutionary union. Now, since we know our culture, those of us in our party, because we're conscious, we ain't got nothing to worry about with these sisters. They are fighters, Jack. Organize them. As a matter of fact, you can sit down. They take on the enemy by themselves. So once you know your culture, you never, like the brother said to me, how can a sister lead us anywhere? My man, you're out your culture. Where are you coming from? Africa produced the first queens in the world. They've been leading us since the beginning. You know, once you know your culture. So if you don't know your culture, you get confused. And of course, the job of the enemy is to make you think you have no culture and make you live his culture. Mm -hmm. One last example, the other day when I had a discussion with somebody, I just said, oh, that's some faggot. I got no time. A white person was there said, how could you use that word? I said, oh, it's a faggot. It's a faggot. You know? I said, how could you use that? I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We're out of cultural context. In the white culture, when you say the word homosexual, it brings up connotation of violence. In our community, we don't beat up on homosexuals. We've never done it. So the connotation is entirely different. When we say faggot in the African community, it doesn't mean the same thing as when you say faggot in the white community. And if you're not careful, you will let their culture go in your culture. 
But we are tolerant people. We are not intolerant of homosexuals, not in our community. So again, if you don't know your culture, you get confused. You get seriously confused. See, brothers and sisters fighting for gay liberation. Fighting for gay liberation. Where are you coming from? In our community? Get out of here. Give me a break. Anyway, everybody knows James Baldwin was a homosexual. Nobody asked him what his relationship to the uh, means of production was. We just asked him, what's your production of the people's trouble? And that's all we are. So if you don't know your culture, you get very, very, you get very confused, very confused. So uh, as a people, of course, we don't know our culture, but our culture must be our weapon, must be our weapon. Uh, it's because of this culture, for example, that we make clear distinctions even on the question of uh, religion and revolution. Karl Marx and Engels said that religion is the opium of the masses. This is true for Europe, given its historical conditions. But if you look at Africa, our revolutions are led by preachers. Chilembe, who was killed in South Africa in his rebellion, he ain't nothing but a preacher. Now, Turner wasn't nothing but a preacher, a righteous preacher, a good preacher, a preacher who led revolution. Malcolm X wasn't nothing but a preacher, Muslim preacher, preacher nonetheless. Martin Luther King, preacher. Jesse Jackson, preacher. Louis Farrakhan, preacher. So if you look very carefully at the African Revolution, you will see religion and revolution goes hand in hand for us. Therefore, if we're not clear in our culture, we'll be talking about, you know, religion is holding us back, and it's going to take some of the essence culture. Some of the essence culture. For people as religious as we are, because we are the most religious people in this country. The word storefront church comes from us. We gave it to them. We have more free churches in our community than any other community. Storefront churches. So uh, you have to be aware always of your culture when you fight. If not, uh, you certainly will be confused. And we have to reach back to Africa for that culture. There's no question here. to come together, organize themselves, and begin to politically educate the masses of our people. That's all. That's all that we need. Everything we have is there. The America is more ripe for revolution today than it was in the 1960s. That's clear. The consciousness of the people is rising. The conditions are getting worse. There must be an explosion. This is inevitable. Therefore, once the consciousness comes together and begins seriously to spread the truth, it will smash a million lives, and these people will jump into organization. Once our communities are thoroughly organized, we will control them, and we will wipe out all crime and all social evils inside our community. So organization is the only answer. The most conscious must join them and push them. Our people must be transformed from a disorganized people to an organized people. tell you now that um, some people are saying that you know the end of ACB ought to fall apart. I cannot take uh, this uh, position. I know that my people are disorganized and hear the statement well. I am not here characterizing the end of ACB, but hear the axiom well. Bad organization is better than no organization at all. Consequently, I do not see that. Uh, the destroying of the NWACP is going to help us because it doesn't mean that those people in the NWACP are then going to join other organizations. It means you have more disorganized people. So uh, our task uh, is to at least try and keep the NWACP as an organization because it helps to create an organizational discipline in our community which we need drastically, drastically. Shakespeare says a rose by any name still smells the same. But I want to say that it, it's been many years since I've seen you. I saw you when I was in college. 
And I'm here visiting my daughter as a student at Spelman, and she, I heard that you were here and I had to come. Thank you. But I think my comment is about education. Yes. Uh, I, I went to a monopoly white school, and I started at the University of Houston in Houston, Texas. And uh, there was a lot of young brothers there, just 500 of us, and they two blacks in a school of, of say, 20,000. But we worked in turn with another school that was down in Kansas Street, Texas Southern University, which was an all black institution. We took the white money and challenged, challenged it and got our money, got the people that we needed to speak at our campus and moved them down to the other school. So it was a way of helping in our own sense. But I think as a commentary to, to people in my age group, when I look at students, I really get sad because I work with a lot of kids in my, my hometown, which is a small town in Texas. But as a parent, even when I was younger, I knew that the only way the struggle could go on is if when my baby was born, I started teaching her at that point. It never should be that you get to be in high school or college and become informed about who you are. You should know that. I mean, I think that's the thing right you can do as a person that's
I know this not just from Dr. Ben or from Henry Clark. I know this from Sigmund Freud in his book, Moses and Monotheism, his last book. So uh, I'm just saying that uh, it's not just coming from uh, what they consider the nastiest of crazy people, Sigmund Freud himself. Anyway, anyone who does any clear archaeological studies must know that Judaism came from Africa. And I know it is a religion. And I know that when the Ethiopians became Jews, they were not looking for a state because Ethiopia is the first state in the world. So they clearly were not looking for us a religion. So I do not confuse with Zionism, but Zionism does attack us everywhere. And not only that, it controls the political relationship on this country on the question of relationship to the Arabs and to the Zionists. There's no, you know, Senator Fulbright just died uh, last week, a couple of weeks ago. But nobody mentioned the reason why Fulbright was never heard about was because he made a statement about how much control they had in the Congress, and he was finished. Now, let me show you how strong we Africans are. Now, watch this, I'll show you. I don't even know what APAC is, A-P-A-C, APAC. Only one brother knows. APAC, you know, you live in a country you say it's democratic. APAC is the strongest lobbying force in the American Senate and Congress, APAC. It is the lobbying force of Israel. It's the strongest. No congressman, no elected official, have ever gotten up and said anything against Israel and got elected. Not one, except one, Gus Savage of Chicago. Just show you how strong we are. You gotta watch your history now. If you're not careful, they fool you. Gus Chavez, while he was running, he got up and said, they give more money to Israel than they do to the ghetto in Chicago. That's why we have so much problems. We ought to cut the money. Say, what? They did everything, 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 everything to stop him from winning. But the Africans in Chicago voted for him. You know how they got rid of him? They gerrymandered his district. Just divided up from under him. So, uh, there's no question that we are the front runners of fights against them, and that's why they're against us. They have to control us, because once we break, they're in trouble. Let me give you a clear example. Martin Luther King supported Zionism. He attacked me, you understand, because of my support for Zionism. But for my, because of my uh, attack on Zionism, Dr. King attacked me. They have an organization in this country called the ADL. It's the African Death League. That's what it is. <laughs> That's what it is. They call it the Anti-Defamation League. But take this. This Anti-Defamation League, which is an arm of Zionism, not of Judaism, eavesdropped on Dr. Martin Luther King's telephone conversations, took all this information, gave it to Mossad, Israeli intelligence, took all this information, gave it to the FBI because they're more thorough. The ADL giving information to the FBI and the CIA on Dr. Martin Luther King, and he supported them, attacked me for them. So uh, just these two facts alone will show clearly that Zionism is the enemy of humanity. I'll tell you, anybody, anybody who all you drops on Dr. King's telephone and collects this information, give it to the FBI, is an enemy of our people, because Dr. King represented us in the best of integrity. So Zionism definitely is, it's getting weaker, and we're going to hit it harder and harder and harder and bring it down. It tries to cause all sorts of confusion, but the reason why I hate them is because they insult us like nobody else does. They insult us. You know, they will say that Farrakhan is crazy. He's anti-this and anti-that. And then when he speaks, his people cheers him, but he makes anti-religious statements. You all think they're attacking Farrakhan. I know they're attacking my people. Now, Farrakhan is my brother. You can attack him. I might look at you, but you touch my people, I'm coming after you. Right. Yes, sir. You come, you touch my people, Jack, I'm coming after you. Yes, sir. You can walk over me, I leave you alone, but you touch my people, I kill you. Yes, sir. So when they're attacking, it's not Farrakhan, they're attacking us. Look at our history. I said, we're the most religious people in this country. It's a fact. We've had our churches burnt. We've never burnt anybody's church. Our culture has never allowed us to burn anybody's church, even though our churches have been burnt left and right. We've never attacked any synagogue in this country, never. We've never defaced any religious institution in this country, never. And these pigs will make it appear as if we like Hitler. They will come attack us everywhere. Kali Muhammad is rising up. They're going to march on the Jews. Give me a break. Who attacks synagogues in this country, us or the white right? Who burns synagogues in this country, us or the white right? 
Do they attack the white right who's doing it? No, they attack us who have a perfect history of attacking no religious institutions, a perfect respect for religion, a people whose culture should be followed by others, and they attack us. They're nothing but slimy scum. <laughs> Zionism here will continue our contact. This question of class and bourgeoisie must be properly understood. We say the African bourgeoisie is the most corrupt in the world, and it is. It is the most corrupt because it doesn't even seek to stand on its own feet. It seeks always to receive money from a white company and work as a worker for this white company, and that's what they are. If you look at them in Africa, they have no hallmarks of the bourgeoisie trying to build factories in Africa and exploit.